Because of what Jesus said and did, people wondered who Jesus was. His followers said to him, Some people say you are John the Baptist, come back to life. Some say you are Elijah, or one of the other prophets. What about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Jesus' follower Peter spoke up. You are the Messiah. But Jesus told them not to tell anyone yet. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and two of the other disciples, James and John, high up on a mountain. When they got to the top, Jesus' appearance suddenly changed. His face shined like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Two men appeared next to him. They were Moses and Elijah. Then a voice came from the clouds, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. The disciples fell down terrified when they got up and opened their eyes. Only Jesus remained. From there, Jesus and his followers traveled to Jerusalem for a huge festival. Jesus went to the temple to share some of his thoughts with the crowd. There, the religious leaders became very angry at what Jesus was teaching. They knew he was claiming that he was the Messiah, the king they'd been waiting for. Enraged, they picked up stones to kill Jesus, but he managed to escape. After leaving Jerusalem, Jesus continued to teach and perform miracles. He heard that one of his good friends, Lazarus, was sick. So Jesus and the disciples traveled to where he lived. When they arrived, they discovered that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Jesus went to the tomb where Lazarus was buried, had the stone rolled away, and raised him from the dead. Soon it was time to go back again to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Two of his followers brought Jesus a meal to ride on as he came into the city. When he did, huge crowds gathered along the streets, shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! The crowds loved Jesus, but it didn't take long before he began clashing with the religious leaders again. He exposed their corruption and threatened their authority. So the leaders began devising a plan to get Jesus arrested. They met with Judas, one of Jesus' followers, who agreed to turn Jesus in to the authorities in exchange for some money. Then, the religious leaders waited for the right opportunity to arrest him. As a pastor, too often I've looked in the eyes of people. And then I feel, as I look at them, that somehow, in some way, I have failed them. I, I look at a person who says, I hope I'm going to heaven. That doesn't sit well because I almost feel, how am I not communicating that they don't have to say, I hope I'm going to heaven, but say it with a sure and certain understanding that because of Jesus Christ, they are going to heaven because of what Jesus has done for them. I can look at a person and I feel like a failure sometimes when they don't understand that the gifts that they have, the money, the house, the food that they have on their table is something that God has given them. It's His gift. And just a response as we see His continuing care for us. And yet somehow it's missed. I feel like a failure as a pastor when I realize that somehow, in some way, I've hindered people in fulfilling their gifts and talents in working in God's kingdom. I've gotten in the way of that in some way, and instead of finding fulfillment in working in the Lord's kingdom work, somehow I've blocked it. As a father, I feel that I have failed as sometimes I look at my kids and they walk by me and they go to their mom for help. Can you help me with homework, mom? And I go, I'm sitting here. How come they don't come to me? 
I feel like a failure as a father when they struggle in school. And I go, what didn't I help them with? What, what did I miss? What am I not seeing? Or if I've just been too busy. I feel like a failure as a husband sometimes when I look at my wife's tired face and are struggling to get things done. Things that I could have jumped up and had a hand in to help with. Uh, Cooking the dinner or helping with laundry or doing some of the chores around the house or just even going and asking her, is there something I can do to lift your burden? And I feel like a failure because I'm not on top of it. And when I look in the mirror, I often see just how a total failure that I am as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as a human being. In the way that I lived out my roles that God has given me to live out in my life, I look in the mirror and I see my sins constantly before me. It's not a good feeling. What about you? I'm sure that all of you have felt like a failure at different times and in different ways in your life. Maybe you feel that, you know, because a marriage ended, that you were a failure as a spouse and somehow you failed that marriage. Or maybe you look at your spouse and just the same things that I struggle with. Maybe it's not a failed marriage, but you know you could do more. Or as a parent, or in your work, or in your friendships with people. We feel like a failure all the times, and when we look in the mirror, we're reminded of it. And sometimes it's accurate. Sometimes we really have failed. We have let people down in our lives. We've even let God down in our lives. And sometimes when we look in the mirror and we think we're a failure, it's not true. but yet we clearly see shortcomings in our life. And maybe our eyes fill with tears as we look in the mirror, but that doesn't mean that the truth that the mirror reflects to us that we have failed isn't true, even if we're looking through tear-filled eyes. And it makes me wonder. It makes me pause and wonder what Jesus felt when He heard the words from Mary and friends of Mary, of Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. Did he feel like a failure? Or the words of those who were caring and mourning with Mary over her brother who said he could open the eyes of the blind. He could have kept this man from dying, couldn't he? Don't you wonder that Maybe for a moment of Jesus when He heard those phrases coming out of the mouths of people that He knew and loved, if He wasn't a failure. Did He feel like a failure? Did He let His friends down? Are those things that He heard from His friends' lips true? Was He a failure? Those who made those statements were looking at Jesus through tear-filled eyes themselves. And we hold that they were not looking clearly at Jesus. Just as we sometimes look at Jesus with tear-filled eyes ourselves, and we go, why? Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through what I'm going through here on earth, Jesus? What have I done? Or why haven't You responded to my prayers? Why haven't You heard my cries from help? Why haven't You responded like You did with David when he cried out in the Psalms over and over again with a heart full of mourning and eyes full of tears? And yet we see in this text that Jesus wept. It says He wept and He was moved deeply. It actually says that twice. That He was moved deeply. Once in the presence of Mary, and once as He stood before the tomb, the Scripture says He was moved deeply in His Spirit. In other words, inside. It's not that He was outwardly maybe as moved, but we see that and we hear that. What does that mean that He was moved deeply? 
And this is where, honestly, our translation in the English, and a lot of the English versions have this translation, that he was moved deeply, really fails to connect the understanding as it was translated from the Greek into the English of what it meant for Jesus to be moved deeply. Weeping, we understand. Crying, we understand. But it's not the best translation. Jesus being moved deeply has a shadow of anger in it. A shadow of Jesus being irritated. Jesus was irritated twice. He was moved to be angered twice. And you can bet that that comes across in His face. Try sometimes not to be angry and have it not come across your face, especially the eyes, right? We furrow our brows together and we set our jaw and our face can have a chiseled figure to it and the mouth is expressionless when we're angry. We can tell and others can tell that we're clenching our teeth and we're irritated and we're angry. It's almost like if you've ever watched Toy Story. Mr. Potato Head in Toy Story. He's going to go out and he's going to try to to save, you know, I think it was Woody. And so he tells his Mrs. Potato Head, I'm going to take my angry eyes with me. And he pulls them out and he puts them in his pack so everybody can see that he's angry. But what is Jesus angry at? What is He irritated at? Is He angry at the mourners? And if so, why? Why would He be angry at them? Is He angry at Mary for what she said? Was He there for not making it there in time to raise or to cure Lazarus from the dead? Was He angry and irritated with Himself that He failed as a friend? He felt some guilt and shame, and so he was angry inside at himself. Is that what he was angry at? Is that what he was irritated about? We may think one of those is the answer. But the reality is Jesus did not fail. Jesus never fails. Angry and irritated he was, not at Mary, not at the mourners, not at himself. Angry and irritated he is at death. Death that had taken his friend. And Jesus wept because we have to experience death. That we have to experience loss and heartbreak and pain and suffering. And try as we might to tell ourselves that, you know, death is part of life and it's just something we all have to go through and it's natural and we have to face it and we have to live with it. And those things can be true, but it is wrong. It feels wrong inside of us. And this is why we don't run to death. We're uncomfortable with death because death is wrong. It's not how we were created. It's it's out of order. It's not what God wanted for us. And so Jesus is angry at death and that we have to face it. Jesus is irritated. We have to suffer. And it wasn't His doing. It's our sin that brought this into the world. And so Jesus looks at us with His own tear-filled eyes at our pain and our suffering that have been caused by death and caused by our sin. And He's angry and He's irritated and He says, no more. That's it. This has to stop. This can't go on any longer. This is not the end. It has to end. And he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Now Lazarus experienced death later on again. But now he's giving a sampling of what is to come. Because Jesus had to do more. He just couldn't get angry and irritated and call it quits. 
Jesus knew that He had to fulfill the will of His Father in heaven. And that meant He would have to go to the cross in order that He would suffer and die and be raised again. That Easter celebration that we have. He set His eyes on serving the Father. He set His eyes on us as brothers and sisters. And He said, no more! I'm done with this! Death has to die. It has to be ending. It has to be put to an end. He sees you. And He sees the sin and the failures that we have. And He says, no more. I want My Father in Heaven to see His children as one who has been forgiven. And we are forgiven. Mary was right. Mary was right in what she said. She was right that He could have healed Lazarus. In fact, Jesus could have spoken from afar and said, go home, your brother's healed, he's out of the tomb. Or even before he died, He could have healed him. He could have brought him to full health and restored him. But it happened as He knew it would. Because earlier in chapter 11, Jesus even says, this is going to happen so that people would see and understand why I'm here to end death, to bring open the tombs of those who have died. Scriptures say that we are to trust in Him and trust in His Word. He went to the tomb and He said, Arise, come forth. He looked to heaven and He thanked His Father for setting up this time and for hearing His prayer. Scriptures remind us that we are wanting to trust in His Word and so He has done this miracle in order that we can look at it and trust in Him. Just as we can look at the thief on the cross and say, Jesus said, today you're going to be with Me in paradise. And we can hold on to the life of Lazarus and the miracle here and we can look at the cross and say, Jesus said to the thief, you know, even though your sins are many, today you will be with Me in paradise. Your sins are gone. And when Jesus says and claims to us, your sins will be and are forgiven, they are forgiven and we can claim that. It's not something that we hope for. It's something that has been done. It's been given to us. And we can dry our eyes. There's no doubt as I stand before you that I fail every day. There's no doubt as I stand before you that each one of you fail every day. But Jesus never fails. He has never failed and never will fail you. He looks at you with love. He looks at you with eyes of grace. Have no doubt in that. And rest in that assurance. And fasten your eyes on Jesus. Amen.